Daybreak in Peter Fire Seaford Wetlands is magical. Waiting birds, birds of prey, and even grazing kangaroos can be seen feeding in this protected area. First imagine what it would have been like some 10,000 years ago. The land to the north and west of present day Melbourne was still volcanically active. The eastern shores of Port Phillip Bay were vastly different than what we know them today. From Morty Oak to Frankston, the tides rose and fell far inland. The shoreline touched the southern boundary of Brayside Park, out as far as Carrum Downs and back to the base of Oliver's Hill at Frankston. A thick layer of shells can still be found underlying most of this area. Around 7,000 years ago, a change took place that saw the sea recede to its present position. This all happened 2,000 years before the earliest Egyptian civilization developed. Slowly, the Great Karam Karam Swamp was forming. Storms created the Great Dunes, which now carry the railway and the Nepean Highway from Mordialic to Frankston. Draining from as far afield as the Dandenongs and Cranbourne, a great freshwater lake formed. Two natural draining points occurred at Mordialic to the north and Frankston to the south. The Boonarang tribe of Aboriginals inhabited the swamp and their territory covered the Mornington Peninsula and the area around Western Port Bay. The swamp provided them with edible plants such as water ribbon tubers and yam daisies. Animals and fish were in abundance, as well as birds and eggs in the breeding season. Many shell middens and flint arrowheads have still been found throughout the district. White settlement was to change all this. Birds and animals being killed to feed the fledgling village of Melbourne. Within a short time, farming too was encroaching on this fertile area, changing the vegetation and hydrology of the swamp. In 1873, a small cut through the dunes was carried out to drain the deeper sections. A wild storm flooded the area and washed out the cut to make Patterson River as we know it today. In more recent times, urban development has encroached even more on the wettest parts. Luckily, a small group of bird observers and conservationists had the foresight to save and protect the last vestiges of this once great swamp. The Karam Karam Swamp once covered over 4,000 hectares. The remaining protected wetlands encompass just 240 hectares. Nearly all the mammals have long since gone, but now a resident group of kangaroos has been introduced and are thriving in the enclosed boundaries of Edith Vale South. The return of bird life too has been nothing short of astounding with over 130 different specimens recorded over a two year period. Many species have visitors from far off shores coming from Japan, and even northern Siberia on their annual migration to avoid the harsh northern winters. Distances of 8, 12 and even 17,000 kilometres are covered to reach our wetlands habitat where the birds continue to feed. The Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of International Importance 
especially as waterfowl habitat is an international treaty for the conservation and sustainable use of wetlands. The Ramsar Convention was signed in Ramsar in Iran on the 2nd of February 1971. It aims to halt the worldwide loss of wetlands and to conserve through wise use and management those that remain. The convention encourages member countries to nominate sites containing representative, rare or unique wetlands, or that are important for conserving biological diversity. Australia was one of the first countries to become a contracting party to the convention and was designated the first Ramsar site, Coburg Peninsula, in 1974. The Edith Vale Seaford wetlands were listed on the 29th of August 2001 as Ramsar Site 1096, Australia's 11th site in recognition of their international importance and specifically because they are the last remaining examples of the Karam Karam Swamp containing a variety of permanent and freshwater and saline wetlands. They support populations of the Australasian bittern considered to be of state significance and threatened. They support more than 1% of the East Asian Australasian flyway population of sharp-tailed standpipers of over 2,000 birds in up to one year in three. They are also considered to be of exceptional significance as examples of cost-effective management of wetlands in urban setting to provide conservation benefits, manage stormwater and encourage environmental education and research. Between the dual carriageways of the Frankston Freeway at Seaford is a magnificent stand of red gums up to 200 years old. Abutting Seaford North Primary School defiantly stand some very old red gums. Luckily, these are now incorporated into the Seaford Reserve. The development of the microscope in the late 16th century opened up a whole new world. Common pond water revealed a host of tiny life forms, much to the amazement of those early observers. A group of volunteers currently take water and mud samples to see what creatures the birds and insects are feeding on. Deep down, water scorpions, dragonfly nymphs, diving beetles and various insect larvae are a few of the smaller inhabitants of this underwater Eden. Freshwater mussels, water snails and caddisfly larvae share the muddy bottom with worms, leeches and clam shrimps. Curly pond weed, water mill foil, duckweed, hornwort, swamp lilies and ribbon weed are just some of the aquatic plants that inhabit this wetland environment. By providing oxygen, food and shelter, these plants form a vital link in the food chain, which in turn supports our wonderful diverse bird population. Most of us associate the Edifail Seaford wetlands with water birds, and rightly so. The area offers three completely different environments. The brackish waters at Seaford with its meadow and wetland surrounds, shallow lagoons and mudflats of Edith Vale South, while Edith Vale North offers deep freshwater lagoons. As we know, each species largely has its own requirements. Crakes, swamp hens and coots inhabit the reeds and surrounds, feeding on water plants, seeds and aquatic insects. Waders such as terns, sandpipers and plovers found feeding on the mudflats at the water's edge. Herons, egrets and spoonbills prefer slightly deeper water feeding on aquatic insects and small fish. Greaves, pelicans and cormorants on the other hand are more likely found fishing in the deeper lagoons. Swans and a variety of ducks are likely to be found in either location, though swans need shallow water when constructing nests. Some ducks nest in the grass reeds, others use hollow trees 
or the nesting boxes provided by the friend. The foreshore at Seaford is a good example of the original tea tree and banksia scrub that originally covered the sandy dunes. Fire too has long been a part of the Australian cycle. We can see from the burnt section at Armstrong's Road at Seaford how quickly nature heals the scars if free from human intervention. Many plant species found at Seaford are salt tolerant and therefore better suited to the brackish water found there. The sea rush, for example, is easily identified. A clump of tall, spiked stalks with a flower bubble at the top. They prefer the shallow marshland. The common reed, fragmite is indigenous to the wetlands and prefers to grow in shallow ponds. Growing prolifically up to two metres high in spring and summer, it dies back in autumn. Although having a tendency to encroach on the open swampland, the dense reeds provide nesting sites and materials for many birds. Swans, swamp hens, reed warblers and crakes are just a few that are observed nesting and feeding amongst the reeds. At either fail, well-defined tracks dissect the reeds. They're used by kangaroos and lead between the water, their shelter and their grazing areas. Occasionally a fox can be spied using the same trail. The wetlands are not always wet. During the summer they dry out allowing different types of vegetation to grow, seed and form corms that the birds rely on. These grasses and sedges die off when rain fills the swamp, creating rotting vegetation for various microorganisms and insects to feed on. The swans rely on the longer reeds in the centre of the swamp to build their bulky nests. Although there are a few birds, when the swamp is dry, it's an important part of the wetland cycle. Morty Lake Creek between the footbridge and Wells Road is worth a visit, as well as offering a short, pleasant walk many birds can be seen amongst the reeds and the bushes. To the south, Cannonock Creek shouldn't be missed. All but the lower sections are of interest. The creek can be viewed from its mainly picturesque foot and road bridges. Melbourne Water and St Leonard's College both near Patterson River, have recreated a wetland environment and installed nest boxes. The Friends of Edith Fale Seaford Wetlands are striving to return the remaining areas to some resemblance of their original state. We would like for you to share in this experience. Tree planting is a major activity. As they grow, native birds will again be attracted to the flowers, seeds, insects, and shelter they provide. Our members also give the time to open the Edith Vale hide throughout the breeding season for public viewing. Over the 15 months since the hide reopened on the 3rd of August in 2016 to when it closed due to the water drying up on the 3rd of November 2018, there were 4,813 names signed into our visitors book. Although few of us are experts, we're exceedingly keen and willing to share information about the wetlands and their inhabitants. The roster involves two hours on duty at the Hyde or the Discovery Centre every month or so. Most members drop in regularly to follow the developing cycle from eggs to chicks to adults. In the past there have been some organised visits to Brayside Park the Briars, Kula, and the Tutguru wetlands to name a few. Fezwi takes every opportunity to mount displays at libraries, 
community events or festivals and visit many schools during the year to talk about the wetlands. Groups and schools are welcome to book a special visit to the hide or organise a kangaroo walk around either fail. We have a great website and Facebook page and lots of information about both Seaford and either fail wetlands. Working together we can achieve great things, but we need your help. Join the friends of Edafail Seaford Wetlands to receive the satisfaction of saving the wetlands for our future generations.